Good morning. Hello. Silencio, por favor. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everybody. How are you doing today? Oh, that doesn't sound like you're really doing good. How are you doing today? Well, it's more like it. That's more like it. If um, you're not working on a service project right now, I'm going to ask you to come a little bit closer. Come on. Don't make me come and get you. I'll do it. A little bit closer and have a seat. I want to take a moment and welcome you all to our 16th annual Martin Luther King Day of Giving Back. I want to take some time to thank my partners on the Youth Commission. My name is Tamoria Saba, I'm the chair, and this is my wonderful team. And we've spent a lot of time trying to put together an amazing day for you all, and we hope you have a lot of fun. We'd like to thank you for making it a day on and not off. Today, we volunteer our time here and in other places in Hopkinton where we can make a difference in the lives of people who need it the most. By joining us today, we hope you realize that volunteering is important, but it also can be fun. It doesn't have to feel like a chore. And any contribution you make is wonderful. It's gratifying, and it brings us all closer together. We have a special guest for all of you this morning, an incredible storyteller of African and African-American culture. Her name is Valerie Tutson. I'd like us all to welcome her. Like I said, if you'd like to get a little bit closer so you can hear her clearly, that would be great. And I hope you enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank Woo, I got the big mouth, can you tell? <laughs> Thank you, Tamoria. It is an honor to be here on this particular day. Oh, good. Did somebody just take the set volume down? Thank you, because I got the big mouth. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> the day our country and the world sets aside to remember the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. You know, a lot of times we just say it's MLK Day. And we don't necessarily even remember to say the full name of the man that we are honoring today, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. That's a whole lot of name for one person, wouldn't you agree? You know, I always figured somebody with a name that long had to be pretty important. And of course, we know that he was because we celebrate him in lots of ways. There are schools named after him, churches named, well, churches, or parks or streets or this national holiday that we have in his honor. But I'm going to tell you something as we get started today. I was only two when Dr. King was killed. So for those of you doing the math, you're about to figure out how old I am going to be in two weeks, or that's all good. I was two when Dr. King was killed. So I didn't grow up during the time when Dr. King was leading the marches, but I am a product of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s because my mother was white and my father was black. And when my parents got married in 1963, they got married before the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his most famous speech that many of us talk about on this day. Who knows the speech that I'm talking about? Which one? 
the I have a dream speech. That's right. My parents got married about four months before Dr. King delivered that speech. And when my parents, my white mother from Worcester, Massachusetts, married my black father from Washington, D.C., interracial marriage was still illegal in 17 of the United States of America. When my parents got married, even though it was legal in New York City where they did get married, it was against the law in 17 states for a black person and a white person to get married. That's kind of remarkable, isn't it? Sometimes history seems so far away, doesn't it? But I can touch that history. Because when I was growing up, when I was uh, your age, Grayson, seven and a half, right? When I was seven and a half, we didn't have a national holiday honoring Dr. King. So my community, my little community, which by the way was kind of like Hopkinton, we did not have a lot of black people in the town where I was growing up. We had five black families. That's it. But even though there was no national holiday, my little community, the few black folks that lived there and many of the white folks who had experienced the powerful work of the civil rights movement would gather in my home church the First Congregational Church of New Milford, and they would hold a celebration honoring Dr. King. A few years ago, I was on my way to a school to go tell stories on Martin Luther King Day before it was a national holiday, and I pulled up into the parking lot and I was thinking about my parents. And this little song came to me, so I'm going to sing it to you right now. I am standing here today because of those who have gone before me. I am standing here today because of those who sacrificed. Yes, I am standing here today because of those who deserve the glory. I am standing here today because of those who fought the fight. I want to sing a song to honor them. I want to sing this song of praise. I want to sing a song to tell everyone. I want to call out their names. 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 Now I call this song praise song. And in the African tradition, it is important to call out the names of people who are no longer living. We can call out the names of people who are no longer living or even the people who are important in our lives, who make it possible for us to be here today. Those people we want to honor, we call out their names. We're doing that on this day. Martin Luther King Day, but I'm guessing that every single one of us in this room knows somebody in our lives or in our experience who we want to honor and we can call out their names, all right? So I'm going to call out some names and I just invite you to give honor by calling out the names of somebody who made it possible for you to be here. And I'm going to call on the name of Nan and Don Tutson. And I'm going to call on the name of Bernard and Pearl Tutson. And I'm going to call on the names of Ruth and uh, and. Herbert Kruger, and I'm going to hum a little bit. In fact, I'm going to sing a little bit more so that you can just call some names into the space as we begin our storytelling time. I want to call out their names. I want to call out their... Oh, y'all don't know what I'm talking about, do you? I forgot where I am. No, I didn't. I'm in Hopkins. Okay, we're going to come back to this. 
All right? But know that we're going to be calling on names before we leave today. And the reason that we are calling on names before we leave today is that we need to understand that we are a part of a legacy. Dr. King didn't do anything by himself. Nobody who makes a difference in the world does anything by themselves. All right, so we're coming back to that song in a minute, but I realized I jumped ahead. I didn't warm you up real good. I forgot to teach you a greeting song that comes from Africa. That'll get your voices in the room with me. I have a friend who comes from Malawi, and they speak English in Malawi, but they also speak another language called Chichewa. And when you greet somebody in Chichewa, you don't say hello, you don't say hola, you don't say what's up. If you want to greet somebody, you say da ku o na. Everybody try that, please. Oh, wait, I heard it. Try it again. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Did I means it literally means I see you. I see you. Can you imagine walking around Hopkinton? I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. And the next part is moni. And that means I greet you with respect. I greet you with respect. I see you and I greet you with respect. I like this song. I, I teach it everywhere I go and I find that it is especially important for us to think about on a day when we are celebrating Dr. King who wanted us to be looking at one another. He wanted a world where people would be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. He wanted a world where people would be seen as fully human. So this song goes like this. Da ku o na, da ku o na, da ku o na, moni. Okay, you got it? Get your hands ready for your eyes up here. So we're saying with our voices and our bodies, I see you with my eyes. I see you with my what? Heart, yeah. I see you right in front of me, and I greet you with respect. All right, got it? I'm teaching you a song that's going to help change the world. Okay? Here we go. Da ku o na, da ku o na, da ku o na, moni. Do it again. Da. Da. And you're going to look that person live in the eye, because we're not looking at anybody dead in the eye. Today, we look at people live in the eye. And you're going to look this person in the face, in the eyes, and you're going to sing this greeting to them. Let them know that you see them, and you greet them with respect. Ready? Here we go. Da
yourselves a hand. You might have noticed that I stopped singing at times. And that was so that you could hear your own voices. And that you could hear the sound of our voices when we put them together. Because that is where the power is. In our own voices, our individual voices coming together. You know, when Martin was a little boy, first of all, when he was born, he was given the name Michael. But when he was about five years old, his father, Michael King Sr., went over to Germany, where he learned much more about the great theologian Martin Luther. And when Michael King learned about what a revolutionary man that theologian was, he decided he was going to change his name to Martin Luther King. And not only was he going to change his name to Martin Luther King, he was going to change his little boy's name to Martin Luther King Jr. So from that time on, he was called Martin or ML for short. Now, when ML was about five or six years old, he went to school for the first time. And some of you might know a little bit about this story. He went off to school, and when he came back home from school, he wanted to go and play with his two best friends, Tommy and Billy, who lived right next door to him. And when little ML changed out of his school clothes and into his play clothes, he went right over to the home of, the, of those friends, and he knocked on the door, 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 but Tommy and Billy didn't come out. And after a little while, the door opened and ML saw Tommy and Billy's mama standing there. And he said, can Tommy and Billy come out and play? And she said, no, they can't, ML. He said, well, why not? And she said, mm, they can't come out. He said, are they sick? She said, no, they're not sick. He said, well, then why can't they come out and play? And Tommy and Billy's mama looked at that little boy standing on her porch and she said, because you are colored and we are white and y'all can't be friends anymore. And she closed the door and left little ML standing there looking at his hands. Colored? Colored? Well, he was kind of brown, but so what? You know, some eggs were brown, some eggs were white. What difference did that make? What, what difference did it matter? He ran all the way home, and when he got up to his home, he was crying. And his mama said, ML, what's wrong? And she sat him down, and she listened. His heart was, oh, I can't play with Tommy and Billy. His mama said, I'm colored. And what is that? And so at age five or six, little ML got his first lesson in the laws of the land segregation, keeping people separate based on their race. But that's not fair, Mama. Why is that? And he also got a whole lot of history about how black folks had been brought over in chains from Africa, forced as property, forced to work on the homes and farms and businesses of white folks until the war came along and finally those enslaved were free, but there was still so much work to be done. When little ML heard that for the very first time, he knew that in his life he wanted to make a change. And the first thing that he needed to do was learn more about his history. I want to tell you one of the stories that comes from the early days of our history. Because ML learned that he was part of a continuum by studying his history. How many of you have ever heard about a woman by the name of Mumbet? Who's heard of Mumbet? Anybody? Elizabeth Freeman? Anybody ever heard of Elizabeth Freeman? Okay, who can, what, what, what about her? What can you tell me? Okay. She was, uh, the, the words were, she was the first black person to free herself. She, in the, 
in the court to advocate for freedom. Anybody else got in Sheffield, Mass? Anybody else got any more information? Okay. So she wasn't the first person to free herself, but she was the first person in Massachusetts to stand up in the court and have herself given freedom in this part of the country. And I want to tell you Mum Betts' story. Everybody, and we all live in Massachusetts. Well, you live in Massachusetts. We should all know this story just as much as we know MLK. We need to know Elizabeth Freeman's story. This story goes like this. It was 1780, and Bet, as she was called back then, lived in Ashley Falls, which is not far at all from Sheffield, Mass., just as you said. You're absolutely right. And she was enslaved to the uh, 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 Ashley family. And on this particular day, Mum Bet was in the kitchen, and she was getting things ready when she heard this noise coming from the other room. And she wiped her hands on her apron, and she went to the door of the big living room where the fireplace was on one side of the wall, keeping the whole, build, the whole home warm. And she saw that Mrs. Ashley had pulled a hot poker out of the fire and had lifted it up above her head, and she was getting ready to bring it down on a young black woman who was cowered in the corner corner. Her name was uh, uh, Lizzie. And when Bette saw that, she ran across the room and she threw her arm out just in time. So when that hot poker came down, it didn't land on Lizzie's head. Instead, it landed on Bette's arm and it sliced through the sleeve of her dress. And then it sliced through her arm. And it was only when blood was everywhere that the women in the room stopped and Mrs. Ashley turned and she looked at Bet and she said, oh, Bet, Bet, I'm so sorry. Are you all right? Are you all right? And Bet looked at her arm and she looked at Lizzie. She could see that Lizzie was okay. And she said, I'll be fine. And then Bet turned around and she went upstairs into the attic space that she shared with the other enslaved women, Lizzie and her own daughter, whom everybody called Little Bet. Little Bet was about your size. <laughs> when Little Bet came in, she said, Mama, Mom, what happened? Oh, Mom, you're bleeding. Are you all right? And when Bet looked at her arm, she said to her daughter, I'm going to be just fine. Oh, Mama, why did Mrs. Ashley do that to you? Would she ever do that to me? And Bette said, oh, you don't need to worry, baby. It's going to be just fine. But Bette knew that those words were not true. Because, you see, Bette knew that because she was enslaved and her daughter was enslaved, if Mrs. Ashley wanted to beat her daughter, she could. And there would be very little that Bette could do about it. And so she started to make her plans to get her freedom. Well, that night when Lizzie was up in the room, Bet asked her, Lizzie, do you ever think about being free? Lizzie said, oh, I think about it sometimes, but I don't know where I would go or what I would do. You see, Bet and Lizzie had been enslaved with the Ashleys since the time they were just babies. They'd never been free at all. But Bet had listened to the men who were working on the Massachusetts Constitution and the, she had heard the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and she had heard the Mass Constitution in 1780, not that long before, all men born free and equal and her very own husband, the father of her daughter, had gone off to fight in that Revolutionary War and he had never come back. But at least he had left her with her beautiful daughter, Bet wanted that freedom that the men were talking about. And so a few days later, she bundled herself up. It was a cold day and she bundled up her daughter and they headed out of their home and they went down by the river and they walked all the way to Sheffield. <laughs> when they got to Sheffield, right there on the main street, they went to see a lawyer. He was a white man, and he had been the secretary for the men when they were working on the Massachusetts Constitution. His name was Theodore Sedgwick. And when he saw Bet at the door, he said, Bet, what are you doing here? Is everything all right? Come in. By now, the clouds had come, and the rain was getting ready to pour down. Come in, come in. It's terrible weather out there. And so Bet and little Bet came inside, and when Bet took off her cloak, Theodore Sedgwick could see the wound on her arm. What happened? 
And Bet told the story of what had happened. Oh, Bet, that's a terrible thing. And Bet looked right at Theodore Sedgwick and she said, Sir, you're a lawyer and I want you to take my case. Excuse me? I want to be free, and you're a lawyer. I want you to argue for my, my case. You can do that. Uh, well, when Theodore Sedgwick heard that, he looked at Bet, and he said, um, uh, <laughs> in fact, he didn't have many words at all, because you see, it had never dawned on him that the words that he and those other men sitting around the table had written would have any bearing at all on women, and particularly black women, or any people of color at all. It had never crossed their mind that all this talk of freedom would mean for everyone. Uh, bet. I, uh, there was a knock at the door. He was relieved by that, and he got up, and when he opened it, there was Colonel Ashley. I've come for Bet. Bet, you're going to have to go. Sir, will you help? Uh, I'm not the only one. Brom wants to be free, too. Brom was one of the men who was enslaved at the Ashley farm as well. Uh, Bet, you're going to have to go. So Bet and little Bet left, and they climbed up into the carriage, and off they went. And as they drove back to the Ashley farm, Colonel Ashley said, Bet, you are not to leave this property. Do you understand me? She nodded her head, and she went back to work. But she had no idea that her visit had disturbed Theodore Sedgwick. He pulled all those books off of the law shelves of his library, and he studied and he studied. He knew that a black woman could not stand up in a court of law. It was not allowed, but a black man could. And he was glad to know that there was a man by the name of Brahm who also wanted to be free. And so he put his pieces together. He sent a deputy over to the home at first, but when Colonel Ashley saw the deputy and saw that the deputy didn't have the proper papers to release his, quote, property, he sent him away and told him to come back. And when they showed up at the door with the proper papers, saying that Bet and Brahm were to be released from Colonel Ashley, Colonel Ashley said, um, Bet, uh, I'm asking you to stay. She looked at her daughter and she said, I want to be free. Mrs. Ashley said, Bet, I told you I was sorry. I didn't mean to hurt you. And Bet said, I want to be free. Colonel Ashley said, these courts order me to release you and that there will be a trial at the end of the summer. Won't you stay? She said, I want to be free. And Bet walked out that door with her daughter and only the clothes that she had on her back. She lived with the Sedgwick family, and she took care of the children. They paid her to do it. They called her Mum Bet, and months went by. And finally, on the third Tuesday of August, it was the day of their trial. And Theodore Sedgwick was nervous, but Bet said, You have it in your constitution, Massachusetts constitution, all men born, free and equal. I heard the Declaration of Independence, free and equal. When they went before the judge, the case was presented. I don't know exactly how long it took for the jury to deliberate, but when they came back, they declared that Bet and Brahm were free. And not only were they free, they were to be paid for all those years that they had worked for free once they were of legal working age. When that money was handed over, Bet was excited. And Theodore Sedgwick said, what do you want me to do with the money? And she said, I want you to pay yourself and then I want you to hold on to it. And I'm going to keep working for you and save up my money. I'm going to need that one day. Bet gave herself a new name on that day. Remember I told you, little ML got a new name? Well, Bet got a new name on that day too. She called herself Elizabeth Freeman because she was free from that day on. She lived in the Sheffield area for the rest of her life. And she was known as Mum Bet, and she was known as a nurse and a gardener and a midwife. She helped bring lots of babies into the world in that part of town. And when she was ready to retire, she collected that money from Theodore Sedgwick that she'd been saving. And she had enough money to buy herself and her daughter and her daughter's child a home. And if you go today 
straight down the Massachusetts Pike, all the way to the, um, I think it's exit two. Exit two, am I right? Okay. Stockbridge Cemetery, right? Stockbridge Cemetery, it's an old cemetery, right on the main street. But if you park your car and you go into that cemetery, way in the back, there's a circle of cypress trees. And right in the middle of those cypress trees, there's a circle of stones, tombstones. And in the middle of those stones, you'll see Theodore Sedgwick and his wife, Catherine. And if you're standing and looking at them, something might inspire you to turn and look over your shoulder. And if you do, you will see a tombstone as big as me with the name Elizabeth Freeman, otherwise known as Mum Bet, because she stood up. Slavery in Massachusetts was ended because Elizabeth Freeman stood up. Slavery in Massachusetts was ended. Ended. Everybody say Elizabeth Freeman. Everybody say Elizabeth Freeman. Everybody say Elizabeth Freeman. Yeah. That's a true story that comes from our history. And these are the kinds of stories that little ML wanted to immerse himself in when he was in school. These were the things that he needed to know about what black people had done in this country, in this place, in this time, standing up to fight for their rights and to be fully human in this place. I don't know if he knew for sure he was going to become the leader, the face of the civil rights movement? Not exactly sure that's what he had in mind. Because you see, he was like 25 years old when he ended up in Montgomery, Alabama. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. Can y'all sing that with me? Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round. So, of course, by the time M.L. Martin was 25 years old and ended up in Montgomery, Alabama, he was, um, you know, slavery, of course, was no longer legal, but segregation was. Separate schools, separate buses, all of those things. And he found himself in the middle of a great opportunity. 
Some of you might know what happened. It was December 1st, 1955. And a woman by the name of Rosa Parks had just finished her day's work as a seamstress at the Montgomery Fair department store, and she was headed home to catch her bus. And when that bus pulled up, she had a lot of things on her mind because, you see, she was the secretary for the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP, and they were going to have a big meeting over that weekend, and she was preparing for that meeting. And so she climbed on board the bus and was getting ready to... Well, actually, she'd already paid her money before she took a look at the bus driver. She said later, if she'd looked at the bus driver, she never would have gotten on the bus at all that day. Because sitting up there behind that bus, uh, behind the wheel of the bus, was the very same driver who had thrown her off the bus 12 years before. And she swore she was never going to ride the bus if that man was driving the wheel. But I told you, she'd already paid her dime, and she had a lot of things to do. So she went, and she went, and she took her seat right behind uh, the front section where the white folks sat. She sat in the first part of the colored section. And all was well until the front part of the bus was full, and then there were no seats. Two white people were left standing up, and the bus driver told her to get up. And you probably know this, Rosa Parks didn't get up. In fact, the woman sitting next to her got up and moved to go stand in the back and Rosa Parks slid over next to the window. When the bus driver said, if you don't get up, I'm going to have you arrested, she said very politely, you may do that. And then when those police officers came on the bus, they gathered up her things and they led her off that bus and she said, Why do you treat us this way? And they said, (laughs) the young one said, I don't know, but the law is the law. So you are under arrest. And she said, hmm, must be something to enforce a law that's not fair to all people. Come on now, we're taking you down to the station. When she got on down to the station, she was able to call her husband, Parks, and he came down with Mr. E.D. Nixon, the president of the NAACP, and uh, a man by the name of Durr. He was a white lawyer, and they bailed her out. And you probably know that they sat together with her, and they said, this is a time. We should take this law out into the streets. We need to change this law. Uh, Are you willing to stand up and fight? Now, Rosa Parks was a fighter. Her family came from fighting for justice, but they also knew how dangerous it could be. So she said she was going to talk it over with her mama and her her husband. And when they were finished, she called Mr. Durr and Mr. Nixon back and she said, all right, I'm ready to fight. They said, come on down to the church. And when she got on down to the church, she met the new minister in town for the very first time, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Now, he didn't say anything that day because he was new to town, but he was listening. And all of the community gathered together decided that they were going to have a one-day bus boycott when Rosa Parks had to go before the judge. And when she went before the judge and when she found out that she was found guilty and charged, uh, uh, twelve I think it was $12 fine for not giving up her seat, the community came back together and they were furious. They decided they were going to to stay off the buses as long as it took to change that unjust law. Of course, they had no idea how long that was going to be. For those of you who know, anybody know how long it took them to stay off the buses? Anybody know? Do you know? Over here. How many? How long? One year. In fact, even more than a year. Good job. It was like 381 or 82 days, depending on when you start the count. Good job. Over one year, they refused to ride those buses. And when they were out there in the streets, people got angry. Black folks refused to ride the buses. White folks who supported them refused to ride the buses. Nearly drove that bus company into 
into bankruptcy. And then, of course, because money talks and always has, it was then that they decided to change the law and let everybody sit wherever they wanted to on the bus. And that's when Dr. King spoke to a great crowd for one of the very first times. And when he stood before that crowd, he said that one day the nation would look back on this moment and say that a great people, a great Negro people, led their country's fight for human rights. Well, friends, that was in 1956, and the struggle continued for a long time. And King himself was eventually killed, as you know in 1968. But those of us who've learned a bit about his journey, who know a bit about his story, and who know that he was part of a continuum, he didn't start the struggle, and he sure didn't end it, know that we can continue the fight as well. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let racism turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna Turn me round, I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching on the freedom land. Ain't gonna let no friends turn me round, turn me round, turn me round, ain't gonna let no friends turn me round, I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching on the freedom land. Martin Luther King Day and the life and the legacy of Dr. King that we remember the power of people working together and the power of people standing up against what is wrong and to speak up for what is right. And it is my hope that we also remember people who helped us do that. So who remembers? Remember I told you we were going to um, do a little song? Do you remember the first one at the beginning? Who's got somebody in their mind who inspires them and who made it possible for them to do the things that they do in their lives? Who's got somebody important in their own life? You do? Who's got somebody who encourages you, who tells you how to be the best person you can be? Anybody got somebody like that in their life? You do. All right. So in a, in a minute, I'm going to invite you to start calling out the names of those people. We can even call out the name of Dr. King today because, of course, he's the one we're celebrating. All right, so get ready with those names and those thoughts. And you might even want to yell out Mumbet, Elizabeth Freeman, or Rosa Parks, or anybody else that you're thinking of. I am standing here today because of those who have gone before me. I am standing here today because of those who fought 
fought the fight. Yes, I am standing here today because of those who deserve the glory. I am standing here today because of those who fought the fight. I want to call out their names. I want to call out their names. I want to call out their names. Now you call. day on, not your day off, and pass on the stories. In African tradition, we say no one is dead unless he or she is forgotten. So when we have a day as this, we need to know the stories of why we have this day. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of the day. Hi, everybody. Hi, Harper. <laughs> Hi, Gigi. <laughs> My kids, if you couldn't tell. I'm just not random, not randomly just saying hi to children I don't know. Even though I've been kind of doing that all day. Hi. You want to say hi? <laughs> right? You excited? I'm that excited? Wow. Great crowd. Maybe I should just do a comedy show instead. Seems like you guys will laugh at anything I'll say right now anyway, right? All right. Yeah. Welcome to the second half of our day together. I hope you all have had a chance to participate in the service activities and other events earlier and enjoyed your lunch. When we think of community service, we often think of providing something material that another person needs or maybe just can't afford. Shoes, clothes, food, toiletries, these are all things that often come to mind. We may think of helping others perform tasks that they can't do alone. Maybe you've helped an elderly neighbor carry groceries into their car or into their home. That was community service. Maybe you've volunteered at a soup kitchen or with the disabled. Maybe you've tutored kids for free. Perhaps your time is so limited that all you can do is donate money or collect items to give to those in needs. That's still community service. Whatever it is you choose to do to give back, know that is an important contribution to improving the lives of others. Yeah, others. Because that's what I wanted to say. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Well, everything I just stated a few moments ago were examples of things we all do often for other people. But sometimes community service looks quite differently than we usually think of it. Sometimes community service means giving a voice to others. Sometimes community service may involve taking a risk to solve a problem. Community service often goes far beyond material and financial needs. Sometimes the needs are based on finding a way to deal with difficult emotions or unexpected life-altering circumstances. But at the core of every type of community service is the desire to let others know that they are not alone in whatever their struggles may be. Is our members of the Youth Commission present? If you are, I'd like you to stand up. I see you hiding, and I want you to stand up. I will go and get you. <laughs> I am so honored to have worked with this team on putting this day together. Your support has meant everything, and I appreciate you all. 
the Youth Commission, the Department of Youth and Family Services, we want, it, we want you to know a few things. We want you to know that no matter what you are going through, you are not alone. You see, we are groups right here in Hopkinton who provide community service. The Department of Youth and Family Services offers free counseling and assistance with any need you could possibly have. The Youth Commission, we partner up with the Youth and Family Services Department to provide community-wide events to bring people together, just like we did here today. A lot of you students have formed groups because you wanted to find ways to serve the community or maybe to meet a need you felt was being unfulfilled. That's also community service. Taswar, our guest speaker today, founded the Hopkinton High School Diversity Group as a way to meet a need. He wanted to bring students of different backgrounds together to celebrate all the ways they are different and all the ways that they are alike. Doesn't this sound like someone else we know? No, not me, not me, no. This was what Dr. Martin Luther King was all about, bringing all people together, rich, yeah, rich, poor, black, white, women, men, celebrating that we are all human, we are all equal, we all deserve to feel loved, respected, and live in peace. But just like Dr. King, anyone who has ever tried to bring a group together knows that there will be challenges. They also know that they can't do it alone. Community service of every type involves finding like-minded people and connecting them together. So just like I'm lucky to have the support of a great team, including the Youth Commission, Youth Family Services, and the Hopkinton Diversity and Cultural Alliance, Taswar has had the unwavering support of his high school diversity club advisor, Mr. Fenn, and the members who are here with him today, Tiffany, Dylan, Max, Jonathan, Kent, and Ryan. And as you can see, all of the groups that I've talked to you about were made up of people from all different backgrounds. We prove we don't have to look the same to care about things that affect one another? If we had a motto, I think it would be, if it affects you, if it hurts you, if it bothers you, we care. Taswar's contribution to his school has provided a unique kind of community service, the opportunity to talk about subjects that are often uncomfortable or deemed as controversial. As adults, we want you to know that we're here for all of you students. If you're sitting in the audience today and having a tough time, or know someone who's having a tough time, let us know. You're not alone. We were all your age once. We know what's up. Stress, anxiety, discrimination, harassment, anger, depression, hunger lack of resources. We adults have a responsibility to you, not only to listen to your needs, but to connect you to resources and support. We promise you that as members of the community who are committed to your well-being, we will do our best to help you in any way we can. Just like Dr. King, we will walk with you we will stand beside you, and we will support you. This is our service to you. Thank you. And now I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Taswar Ferdous.
I say they have a question on Matthew? I think so. I think they do. Uh, I can read after. Yeah. Hi, everyone. First, I'd just like to thank Tamoria and the rest of the Hopkinton Youth Commission for hosting this amazing event on MLK Day. Also, I'd like to thank all of you for using your day off to come here and play a large role in spreading cultural awareness and promoting diversity in our community. I founded the High School Diversity Club in my sophomore year. I started with the intention of promoting and spreading cultural awareness and promoting diversity in the high school community. In this presentation, I'll be talking about my endeavor in leading the club and some of the personal obstacles I faced in the process. I hope my story sparks some inspiration in some of you. I wanted to give back to my community and founding the Diversity Club was the way I sought to do that. Diversity and culture are things I've always been passionate about. I was born in Dhaka, Bangladesh. I immigrated to America when I was a year old with my family. My culture and nationality have always been fundamental aspects of my character, which I'm proud of. I love learning about the cultural backgrounds of other people, listening to their stories and understanding something new about our society. This is why diversity is beautiful. Diversity Club was really my way of expressing something I was passionate about, but also my way of taking initiative to make a difference. But what I've learned is that trying to make that difference isn't so easy. We've struggled to maintain and grow membership. Interest in the club has waxed and waned over the past couple of years. And I've often asked myself, what was I doing wrong? Why wasn't Diversity Club able to maintain its members like the other school clubs? However, I'm so glad I didn't give up. Continuing Diversity Club was one of the best decisions I've ever made. Perhaps the high school wasn't quite ready to tackle racial issues head on for one reason or another, but I feel I had a voice and a cause worth putting out there. Over time, I realized that Diversity Club was not only a passion of mine, but also a responsibility. I really wanted to expose the community, and especially students, to cultures all around the world. We as Americans live in an interesting time, to say the least. Society is globalizing so quickly, and America is becoming increasingly diverse in such a short period of time. It's important that students here prepare for an environment far more different than Hopkinton. We're going to be meeting kids from all over the world. We're going to be meeting Hispanics, Arabs, Indians, African American, etc. as we progress through our college experience. Why don't we prepare ourselves to develop a mindset comprised of cultural receptivity and awareness? Even our workforce is becoming increasingly diverse. Diversity is rapidly becoming a fundamental aspect of our social and our work life. Preparing students for a global society and for careers spanning far beyond Hopkinton should be part and parcel of our academic and extracurricular experience. And as I thought about this, I realized that I couldn't quit because if I did, I would be depriving my community of something it needs. My realization of this and my newfound inspiration to continue Diversity Club was because of certain issues that affected me personally, as well as issues I heard in, here in the high school. These issues all revolved around discrimination. I didn't start Diversity Club with the intention of attacking a problem. The club was an outlet for me to improve my community through something I was passionate about. But due to the unfortunate circumstances that have afflicted our minorities in this community, I realized how important it was to continue Diversity Club and its activism for equality and acceptance. Unfortunately, racism is a problem that all age groups are faced with. As I'm sure you all know, this past summer, an African-American college student who grew up here in Hopkinton was called the N-word by a group of young students in our community. Now, I'm not going to stand here, point out the obvious, and say that this is a clear problem. 
but rather I will tell you how necessary it is for us to promote cultural and racial awareness so things like this don't happen. We must take initiative to educate ourselves and those around us so that people of color, as well as those who are different from the norm, whether it's socioeconomics, socioeconomics gender, age, sexuality, etc., feel safe and accepted. We need to teach our youth fundamental ideas of equality, which should be carried on later in life. No matter how valuable of an education you receive here in Hopkinton, discrimination will continue to leave us ignorant and oblivious to our society if we don't take it upon ourselves to be the change. Even my own mother has faced discrimination and racial harassment in her work environment here in Hopkinton. She was racially harassed and stereotyped by her coworkers. They assumed she was Indian based on the way she looked, but they also made several derogatory comments, including things like, oh, she smells like curry or whatever. To think that discrimination continues as we grow older, especially right here in our own community, demonstra demonstrates the need for change and cultural receptivity. We, the students, do see racial harassment in the high school and also in professional work environments in our community. All of this has been my inspiration to persevere and continue Diversity Club. I knew there had to be something done to prevent problems like this from happening again. But now I'd like to commend Mr. Finn, the Diversity Club advisor, and our members for their ongoing dedication to this club. They've been extremely devoted. Almost every meeting, Mr. Finn brought food for the members. If he ever forgot, he always went to the store and brought back snacks for us. And the few members the club had, like Dylan Morrow and Max Siegfried, they continued to show up to every meeting, even though they knew they would be the only ones there. And recent members, like Jonathan Goldberg, Ken Berlin, Ryan Cavino, and Tiffany Ramsaran, have kept Diversity Club alive. With this newfound support and encouragement, Diversity Club endured. We challenged ourselves to be creative and ambitious. We brainstormed every meeting about things we could do to accomplish our ultimate goal. And eventually, we thought of an outlet that we would never have considered, wristbands. We realized that the problem with Diversity Club was that we were too exclusive. We wanted to make an impact on the community, yet the only students that were exposed to our message were the members. If students didn't come to Diversity Club, then we would bring Diversity Club to them. Essentially, we designed blue and white plastic wristbands with equality written around them in different languages. Words like Samhanta, which is Hindi, or Musawa, which is Arabic, all meant the same thing, equality. And the circular shape of the wristbands, as well as the different languages being connected together, were really our way of exemplifying unity and harmony. This was our way of promoting ethnic and cultural acceptance in our community. And we all collectively invested our own money into the wristbands, ordering more than 100 and selling them to the student body. I never would have thought that the other members and I would invest our own money into this club. But at that point, I realized that we had no choice but to take risks in order to impact our community. And as I stand here, I can't even explain how happy I felt once we started selling those wristbands and people actually began wearing them. The wristbands were a symbol of acceptance. They were a symbol of equality. Whenever I saw students in my class or in the halls wearing them, I felt hopeful. I felt our community became stronger. And most importantly, I realized that we were beginning to make a difference. And that is when I began to discover how Diversity Club could contribute to our community. However, all of us are seniors. We're all leaving this year. And as excited as I am to end my senior slide and begin this new chapter of my life, I still have one question in mind. What will happen to Diversity Club? What will happen to this small organization of ours that Mr. Finn, the members, and I feel so passionate about? Diversity Club has impacted me so much. It's changed me. I'm now a stronger and more determined person because of it. We brought this club to life with years of time and effort, 
and I don't want it to die. So now I leave it in the hands of all of you. I challenge you to take what we've started and to grow it. Promoting diversity and making a change was a lot harder than I expected. And I believe there's still so much more to do. Never be afraid of leading a cause or making a difference. You are a lot more capable than you think. Which is why I ask you to help join this movement. Make diversity flower in the community and demonstrate that it isn't a bad thing. I hope one day Diversity Club will not only spread cultural awareness, but it allows everyone, white, black, or brown, to cherish what makes them different and realize and, and feel confident enough to share that, con uh, share that difference with others. I'll be leaving Hopkinton to start my first year in college, and I'll be exposed to a variety of races, cultures, and beliefs in one community. And I hope one day I can come back to Hopkinton and see that as a town, we aren't so different from that. I hope one day I'll be able to see us continue to celebrate our differences and see people eagerly wanting to learn more about the unique, cult unique culture that constitute our world. Although Diversity Club hasn't made an impact as big as I hoped it would, I hope it's a symbol of initiative and change, influencing all of you to take a stand for what you are passionate about and what you believe is right. We're all different. We all have different backgrounds, stories, traditions, and beliefs. And it so happens that the color of our skin or our religion can sometimes be an indication of that. I'm proud to be Muslim. I'm proud to be Bengali. But most importantly, I'm proud to be American. And I hope you're proud to be you. Thank you. And, um, we're also going to be doing a questionnaire, a Q&A session, uh, so you guys can ask myself and the members any questions about um, our experiences with uh, leading Diversity Club and so on. Oh, yeah. That sounds awesome, is it? and you said it was at the Elmwood School? Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, I think promoting diversity even in, you know, in the elementary school sounds like a great idea, um, and us uh, as an organization would be will completely willing to contribute to that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure, you over there. Um, thank oh. you for starting this club. I think there are a lot of us in the community who appreciate it deeply. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak to some of the impact that you've been able to make in the lives of kids um, at the high school through your uh, club? What impact we would be able to make on the high school kids with this club? Is that the question? What impact you've been able to make, yes. Um, that you've been able to make already. Oh, the impact that we've already been able to Why make. Why don't you ask maybe some of the members? Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah, um, I joined Taz when he started up the club, and it's it's definitely impacted me. It's helped me to become, to uh, have a much more open mind in, in my daily life. And like you said, with these wristbands, people have been wearing around school. We know that people are getting our message. Um, yeah, I don't know. that We've got a sophomore member who's also joining. It's It's been a really, it's every day, or not every day, every club meeting, we'll, I, we'll talk about other cultures or we'll have a movie night. We have we watch like cultural movies, like Bollywood movies and such. And just seeing that um, from somebody who, who is not from that culture, who's never been exposed to that culture, it really, it, it does great things to open up your mind and help you think a lot broader. It's fantastic. Any other questions? Thank you. I, um have been in the middle school gym in many years other than uh, town meeting. My kids, I'm an empty nester, so I, I, I'm here and just enjoying and seeing, you know, what Hopkinton's up to these days. I applaud what you're doing and I loved your talk. My question is, 
I understand there are other clubs in the school, like LGBTQ and, and maybe some others. I'm curious how your club uh, you know, works with or supports or collaborates, if at all, with the other clubs at the high school. Yeah, so, yeah, actually, I think the club and myself have kept that in mind, um, how there are so many um, other clubs that kind of promote the same cause as we are, you know, equality and acceptance. Um, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, like a year after Diversity Cl Club started, we started noticing a lot more other clubs that are oriented around specific um, ethnicities and cultures. Um, however, like being able to collaborate with, this, with these other clubs, that isn't um, something we've come to doing yet because we were so focused on um, progressing our own club and having it grow. But because we've started to kind of understand how, how exactly would c we could contribute to our community through things like wristbands or hosting these events, uh, we're more than willing to um, be able to interact with these other organizations and further promote our cause because, you know, with more of a following and, you know, considering other perspectives, um, not just ethnic perspectives, but, but you know, things like sexual orientation and gender and so on, it's very important to consider those things um, as diverse. So the Diversity Club will definitely plan to uh, you know, uh, work with these clubs and promote our cause even more. Uh, thank you all so much for working so hard in this club and clearly here as our world continues to grow smaller and smaller and we're living so much closer to one another, the idea of equality is, is important for our own survival, right? But I'm curious here today if any of you from the club have advice for the high school administration or your classmates as to what we can do as followers to your ideas to help continue to make our school and our community as respectful and caring as, as you clearly want it to be. So you have the uh, podium, so to speak, and we would be all ears if you have advice for us as here's a day we're all trying to learn and grow and get better. I mean, I'd just like to say you clearly are doing everything you can right now to, to promote this, but I think just further, once we leave the diversity club, it's going to slow down, but just make sure that, that you could that you could promote outlets like this, kind of like outlets for other people to see what other, what other people have to say. And you're already doing a great job of that. I, I can't think of anything specific, really. But yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ms. Rihanna. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Um, I have a sophomore in the high school, and I'm curious where so many of you are seniors. Um, in your four years, have you seen a change, either positive or negative, in the dialogue um, among your peers or, um, you know, the, the issues or the attitudes? Have you seen things as we've become more diverse as a town, have they gotten worse? Has it gotten more comfortable to talk about things? I'm just wondering what your read on the temperature is at the school among peers. That's a great question. Thank you so much for asking about that. Um, I think, yeah, it, it's becoming very obvious that our community is becoming diverse. If you're comparing, you know, the upperclassmen with the lowerclassmen, you'll you'll see that the freshman and sophomore grades are so much more diverse. And I think that's actually a very positive thing, and it's creating a positive dialogue because we're starting to see, um, you know, a variety of cultures that are encompassing our school community. Um, so I think that's actually exposing a lot of students in our community to these different cultures and they're, it's, they're allow it's allowing them to kind of accept these cultures and prepare them for the future. Um, but in regards to the dialogue regarding Diversity Club, it's interesting because when we started Diversity Club, you know, around our sophomore, uh, junior year, the, the dialogue really wasn't that positive because people kind of felt uncomfortable, un uncomfortable about the club. They didn't really understand what we were about. And many people thought that we were kind of excluding the majority and we were only accepting minorities when that really wasn't the case. Diversity Club was about accepting everyone. And it w actually wanted to prepare the majority of students um, to become exposed to these um, different cultures um, and everything like that. So 
I think it's actually great that we're seeing um, a more positive dialogue now, and I think that'll um, continue to support outlets like Diversity Club, which are trying to support this cause of equality and acceptance. I'd just like to respond to that as well, too. I think first I'd like to just uh, express, you know, how proud I am to work with these guys. Taz and the rest of the group have really been an inspiration for me. Um, and I'll just mention very briefly, I, when I grew up in, in Hopkinton in the early 80s, we were just, as a nation, coming to grips with the question of whether or not we were going to honor um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. And I, and I remember it being a bit more contentious than I expected. Um, times have changed, of course, for the better. But it, to speak to your question, I think in the, in the current climate, uh, politically and otherwise in this nation, I think it's really important that we have the next generation of people uh, willing to address and, and discuss these issues openly and honestly. Um, and so I look forward to the, you know, to the club continuing and, and progressing. And these guys, I think, have uh, worked hard to leave a good legacy. So I'm looking forward to that. So I was... I was curious, you guys said that you're mostly seniors, so what's going to happen with your club when you guys all graduate? Do you have more um, people interested in it, or I'm just curious, I want to make sure it goes on, so I just didn't know if you guys had any younger classmen that are interested in going on in the club or not. Um, yeah, that, that's a great question, and that's a concern I... Um, that, that's actually a really big concern for us as of now because, yeah, we are seniors and uh, it'll be problematic for us to continue Diversity Club in this community. So, um, yeah, that's actually a question we don't really know the answer to. We don't know what's going to happen in Diversity Club. And we don't know if it's going to exist next year. But what we do know is that you guys who are in Hop, who will continue to stay in Hopkinton, um, can contribute to Diversity Club's cause, regardless of whether it's in the high school or not. Um, you know, it's very important that all of you are able to make that difference um, and take the initiative to try and promote what you believe is right and what you are passionate about. So really, Diversity Club was kind of our way of trying to inspire all of you guys to continue our legacy. Maybe Diversity Club won't necessarily survive as, you know, an entity, but I think you guys and the students um, can truly follow Diversity Club's example in trying to start something up and promote um, a positive message of acceptance and equality. It's going to survive. Thanks. Um, that's my promise to you. <laughs> I will not let it die. So I think, you know, that's where we as adults and parents and administrators, you know, you have to listen to this plea and think about what are you personally doing to encourage your own children to join groups like this. It's really on us. We can't expect the kids to always have the burden put on them. You know, we have to step up to the plate. Uh, well, oh, sorry. So I'm a part of the HHS TV Media, which is the news station at the Hopkinton High School. And what we've done in conjunction with HHS, with Diversity Club, is we've expressed their morals and we've tried to promote their ideas and their beliefs. And we've gotten a lot of feedback saying we really appreciate how you're doing this, and from a lot of people actually 
especially from the student body and from other teachers and staff members saying, we really appreciate what you're doing and it's important to us too that we express these morals and we make a difference because right now in the world we live in, it's sometimes good, sometimes bad, but I think personally that we can make it a good place. Yeah. Okay, sure, thank you for the question. Um, we have advisory uh, generally two times a month, and I think a lot of the, um, the activity in the advisory is geared around uh, folks participating in um, you know, collaborative activities, and also it, it provides a time generally for folks to, uh, for students and teachers to discuss about issues that are, that are important and topical. So as a club, we haven't necessarily um, had any di any um, advisory time devoted specifically to the club, but I do know that the members um, and myself have also, um, you know, have have been engaged in in those advisory activities as far as uh, tolerance and um, discussing issues. I think when when the incident occurred earlier this year, there was some significant time devoted in advisory to discussing that, to allowing students to. Um, voice their concerns, their confusion um, over that. And I think it's important in a, in a community like ours, which is generally um, progressive and inclusive, the idea that there's a real need for diversity uh, sometimes gets lost in our day-to-day -day, um, busy schedules. Um, but, you know, I think the school is doing a, uh, a, a good job at trying to allow students to talk about it and maybe um, the group myself as an advisor can take a little bit more of a leadership role in trying to bring that into the advisory curriculum so to speak so um, it's an effective platform for, for for doing this we haven't probably used it as much or as well as we could um, but it is an effective way for students to really connect with each other outside of uh, the academic classes so thank you Right, yeah, and I'm really sorry about this situation. And just adding on to the uh, advisory question, um, I'm actually part of the Unite program, which, you know, basically you have upperclassmen um, being involved with uh, these advisories and, you know, trying to spread and promote positive message to these underclassmen. And I can guarantee you that the Unite the, the UNITE program in the high school is going to do whatever they can to promote positive messages, messages of acceptance and equality because, you know, as we're seeing these lower classmen enter, you know, become involved in the high school, uh, we're seeing them extremely, di like they're extremely diverse compared to the upperclassmen. And so as we're seeing our high school community become more diverse, um, you'll definitely see a response from administration and the UNITE program um, in doing whatever they can to promote messages, uh, whether um, it's in the extracurricular activities or in advisory. If you could, would you start another um, diversity club at the college? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I, I really feel passionate about diversity club um, and it's definitely something I would um, try to continue in college and I'm sure that whatever college I'm going to, there will already be um, a diversity organization and you know, promoting the same messages and the same cause um, of the diversity club here. 
So that's definitely something I'm willing to get involved in. And I'm sure you know the members here, they're willing to get involved in uh, future diversity organizations as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Young man, that was a great question. I'm wondering if you would be interested in coming to some of our meetings when you get a little bit older. That would be great. And a transition over to the music portion of the program. Just give us a minute to get our Hopkinton Youth Strings Orchestra situated. Hi, everybody. My name is Rebecca Knapp, and I'm a music educator in the area. Um, before you even hear these kids play a note, I'd like you to give them a round of applause for coming to school on their day off. <laughs> So um, this isn't really our full group. We go through different iterations. A few of friends sitting up here have been with me since the beginning, but we um, these kids are awesome. Talk about a diverse group. Um, we have Sah oh, we, sorry, Ben Tai Sahil, Gigi, Michael, Brian, and Doris. And our youngest players are in second grade. Uh, we have a pretty wide range. Um, these kids have so much fun playing with each other. They, they don't even know they're learning. They're just having fun. So we rehearse on Sundays. Um, we actually are just getting back together after a little holiday interlude. And so the piece we'll be sharing with you is called uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Uh, it's a little bit of a mashup. It also has children um, go, Whoops. go where I send thee, which is another African-American spiritual. And so we're sharing one piece today, and I hope you guys enjoy.
to see you. <laughs> uh, um, it's really, really an honor for us to be here, even with uh, such a small crowd. We're very happy to have been invited by Timoria, and um, uh, we are Colenu, Boston's Jewish Community Chorus. Um, it means a lot to be uh, at an event like this. Um, the, uh, the Jewish community and the African American community certainly have a long history in this country, it's very pleasant to go back and talk about the beautiful things that happened during the civil rights movement, some real, some real coming together of two communities there, and more than two communities. But of course there is also much more complicated stories from both before that time and after that time. I personally have just uh, been learning about the time when the Jewish community came to this country and were not considered white along with the Italian community and Irish community and several others. So there was a whole history that is quite complicated uh, and uh, by virtue of a variety of things, not the least of which our skin color, many would say that we did in fact become white in the Jewish community. Um, uh, there's a, a lot to talk about that. I found it really interesting to kind of consider that history. Uh, but what we wanted to do today was to be here and to bring uh, some of our Jewish repertoire uh, to this event um, and to stand together and celebrate this remarkable man who understood so much about uh, the power of community and the power of communities coming together and the the responsibility that we have toward one another. In fact, rather than use my own words, from his letter to uh, letter from the Birmingham jail, 
We are tied together in the single garment of destiny, caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. And whatever affects one directly affects all directly. We'll sing for you now um, a song, Sisu uh, et Yerushalayim. It's a text um, from Isaiah. And uh, uh, we offer it now um, knowing that Jerusalem is a very important spiritual place and symbol to uh, communities, including the Jews, Christians, and to Muslims all over the world. Rejoice with Jerusalem, all you who love her. comes to understand. Thank you. 
This is the other text from Isaiah. And I shall bring them to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. If you listen to this uh, arrangement of this uh, old song, you'll hear perhaps different peoples walking in together. Yes. 
Mrs. Victor Kairos. Thank you for now it's your turn. Yes, sparse as we are, we're going to do this thing. You're going to sing in Yiddish. <laughs> Unexpected, I know, on MLK Day. I don't know that he was big into Yiddish. But I bet he was big into this word. Oi. 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 This is one of the most valuable words that I believe that Yiddish has brought to our all cultures. So that's your word. That's what you're going to sing. Uh, if you can grab some more words, you're more than welcome to. And actually, do we still have Abby here? Is Abby in the audience? Did we lose Abby? There was, there was someone who had sung this song before. Is she, did, do you think she's back there? Abby! <laughs> Abby, if you want to come sing with us, now's the time. Anyway, but everybody should sing with us. I think you're going to get it. Um, uh, but let me give you a translation. <clears throat> and you'll see why we thought maybe it was a good piece for um, this event. Um, and before I give you the translation, I guess I, I wanted to say one other thing. Personally, I can't, I can't speak for everyone here, but um, uh, and I unfortunately missed a, a, a a significant portion of that beautiful diversity committee that looks like they're doing great work. What I've learned about um, uh, being a, a mostly white person in this culture is that for really doing the work of diversity, discomfort is a, a way to go uh, that to, for us white people especially. And, and I think also for us Jews because we have our whole own complicated story and it's perhaps gotten more complicated in recent times. Uh, but it's still deeply uncomfortable to talk about these things with one another. And um, I guess the thing that I've learned, of late especially, is that it's our job to sit with some of that discomfort. Um, music helps so much. And we are all brothers, and we sing happy songs. And we all are united no matter what we have. And we are all happy singing songs and tapping our feet. And we all stick together like nobody else. And we all love one another like a groom with a bride. And we are all sisters like Rachel, Ruth, and Esther. Please sing along. Und 